Okay, great. Yeah, I can see that. You can see them uh, full screen, right? Yes. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Crunch Seminar. Today, we have two talks. Uh, the first talk is given, given by Dr. Stefania Fresca from Polytechnic University of Milan, Italy. She's currently a young postdoctoral researcher at the Laboratory for Modeling and Scientific Computing in the Department of Mathematics. Sandvania obtained her Master of Science in Mathematical Engineering from Polytechnic University of Milan. In spring 2021, she obtained her PhD in Mathematical Models and Methods in Engineering, also from the same institute. Uh, her current, current research interests are scientific machine learning, reduced order modeling, deep learning, numerical approximation PDEs, and their applications to engineering problems. Uh, welcome, Stephanie, and you may start your presentation. Thanks. Um, thanks for the kind introduction, and uh, good morning to everyone. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for, uh, for giving me the possibility to present uh, my work today. This work is in collaboration with uh, Nicola Rares Franco, Paolo Zunino, and Andrea Manzoni, also from MOX uh, at Politecnico di Milano. <clears throat> Today, I will talk about uh, deep learning based uh, reduce order models uh, for the solution of uh, nonlinear time dependent parameterized PDEs. So, we are interested in solving a full order model expressed as a parameterized dynamical system. It may arise, for example, from the semi discretization of PDEs. Solving the form in two contexts, real time and multi query applications uh, like uh, uncertainty quantification, parameter estimation, optimization, tasks or the implementation of digital twins um, entails a prohibitive computational cost when the dimension of the form is large. Reduce, uh, sorry. Okay. So the goal is the accurate and real-time solution of the form. And uh, in order to achieve this goal, uh, we rely on a reduced order modeling. That is, uh, it aims at replacing the form by a model showing much lower complexity, but still able to express the physical features of the problem under investigation. The goal of reduced order modeling is the efficient approximation of the parameter to solution map. Two main steps uh, must be considered usually in the construction of a ROM. The first one uh, is, consists in the approximation of the solution manifold, where the solution manifold is the set of all the PD solutions by varying time and parameters. So one is interested in approximating the solution manifold by means of a suitable trial manifold. Then the identification of a latent representation embedding the reduced dynamics onto the trial manifold. Traditional linear ROMs uh, approximate the solution manifold by means of a linear trial manifold defined in terms of a matrix B. These metrics can be computed, for example, by means of proper orthogonal decomposition. And it plays an encoding decoding role that is uh, starting from the form solution, the intrinsic coordinates are computed by means of the encoding phase, and then the ROM solution is recovered by means of the decoding. Regarding the reduced dynamics, uh, it is intrusive, and uh, it's described by means of a parameterized dynamical system of dimension n, where n is smaller than the form dimension nh. It is obtained by projecting the form residual onto the linear trial manifold. 
Starting from this uh, linear intrusive setting, we formulated an alternative framework where the solution manifold is approximated by means of a nonlinear trial manifold defined in terms of an autoencoder neural network. The autoencoder neural network plays the same role of the previous matrix V, but in a nonlinear fashion. The reduced dynamics instead is described by means of a nonlinear function which directly maps the parameters into the intrinsic coordinates. Instead, this relationship was instead intrinsic in the case in the previous setting. So, more precisely, a linear ROM looks for an approximation of the FOM solution defined expressed as combination or as linear combination of basis functions, where the basis functions are the columns of the matrix V. As I said, the solution manifold is approximated by means of a linear trial manifold where U and N are the ROM intrinsic coordinates. The function mapping the low dimensional intrinsic coordinates into the high dimensional ROM approximation is here linear. And the reduced dynamics is described by means of a parameterized dynamical system. A nonlinear ROM instead looks for an approximation of the FOM solution defined in terms of a nonlinear function CH. This function defines the nonlinear trial manifold solution approximation of the solution manifold. The function mapping the intrinsic coordinates to the RAM approximation is nonlinear. And as I said before, the reduced dynamics models directly the relationship between the parameters and the intrinsic coordinates. POD Galerkin ROMs are an example of linear ROMs, and they are built starting from snapshots taken from a set of FOM solutions obtained, for example, by means of the finite element method. The main building blocks of a POD Galerkin ROM are POD dimensionality reduction, thus, a basis for the linear trial manifold is obtained. Galerkin projection through which the ROM equations are computed. And finally, <clears throat> hyper reduction techniques used to deal with terms that depend nonlinearly on either the solution or the parameters of the problems. Starting from the setting of linear projection based methods, we generalize to the nonlinear case. In particular, we propose uh, a new class of nonlinear, non intrusive ROMs uh, based on deep learning algorithms, which we call DL ROMs. Then, in order to enhance the performance of the ROMs when applied uh, when considering large scale forms, uh, we propose a second strategy, POD DL ROM, which combines the best features of deep learning algorithms and POD dimensionality reduction. Starting from the POD DL ROM technique, uh, several extensions have been developed, um, such as the multi channel POD DL ROM uh, used to deal uh, with problems um, involving more than one field variables. Um, every time a low dimension. If I may, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, can you motivate the use of POD and DL? So when you say deep learning, you mean the autoencoder, right? Now, why do you go back to POD? Yeah, because uh, the POD in the, this context that I will, show, I, was, I will show later has a different purpose with respect to a POD Galerkin ROM. That is, we use a POD only as a first layer, like a filter, to reduce a dimensionality, to decrease the dimensionality, but not to arrive at the intrinsic dimensionality of the problem. Let's say I want to move from 1 million of degrees of freedom to 1,000. It's used only in this sense to perform a prior dimensionality reduction, but not to capture the intrinsic dimensionality of the problem. I guess it will be more clear later in the rest of the presentation. OK, it, it, it sounds a little arbitrary. On, on how you decide, but I'll, I'll wait and see the, the your examples. Uh, 
Okay, perfect. Thanks. So um, I was saying that uh, every time uh, a low dimensional ROM, uh, POD Galerkin ROM is available and it can be exploited uh, for the construction of non, of non intrusive and real time ROMs uh, in the POD GDL ROM framework. When the POD dimension is uh, small, and the computational bottlenecks uh, is represented by the hyperreduction stage used to handle nonlinearities uh, uh, in the construction of the ROM. Deep IROMnet can be used uh, for the approximation of discrete operators. Finally, we were also interested uh, in uh, the extrapolation uh, capability of the technique that is uh, computing the ROM solution uh, over a larger over a larger time window with respect to the one seen during the training phase. And for this reason, uh, we developed the new TPOD LSTM ROM technique. Deep learning based reduced order models uh, have proved to be general and robust. Um, indeed, they have, uh, they have been successfully applied to a very broad range of examples, um, such as uh, cardiac electrophysiology, which is the class of problems that at the beginning motivated us uh, in the development of such techniques uh, in order to overcome uh, the limitations uh, of uh, POD Galerkin ROMs when applied to this context. Then cardiac mechanics, fluid dynamics, FSI problems, advection dominated problems, and also an industrial application related to the approximation of the behavior of MEMS, of microelectromechanical systems. So by starting from cardiac electrophysiology, the electrical activity of the heart uh, can be modeled by means of PDEs, like the monodomain equation, which is responsible for the phenomenon at the macroscopic level. Coupled with a system of ODE, like the Alia Pamphilo ionic model, which instead describes the phenomenon at the microscopic level. The semi discretization of such coupled PDOD system by means of, for example, the finite element method or a knobs based isogeometric analysis represent our form, our full order model. And by solving it, we are able to simulate uh, heart pathologies like atrial tachycardia or atrial fibrillation, one of the two most common heart arrhythmias. The point is that uh, the small time step and mesh sizes um, required in order to obtain an acceptable accuracy entail huge computational costs uh, to solve the form, especially if one is interested in uh, a multi-query context uh, where the form must be solved for, uh, for multiple times. On the other side, even a linear approach is not results to be not effective. Indeed, by starting from a form almost uh, with a dimension almost equal to 5,000, even by considering almost 1,000 basis function, we are not able to achieve sufficient accuracy. So, a POD Galerkin ROMs show several limitations when dealing with the cardiac EP context or when solving hyperbolic problems, advection dominated problems. For example, the linear superimposition of modes results in a very high dimensional linear trial manifold in order to get an acceptable accuracy. Evaluating the ROM required to solve a dynamical system, which might be unstable unless the time step size is very small. The ROM must also account for the dynamics of all the field variables, even if the interest is only in one or part of them. Obviously, these limitations compromise the efficiency of POD Galerkin ROMs, and in order to overcome them, we develop the DL ROM technique. In this case, uh, the approximation of the form solution uh, is defined in terms of the decoder function of a convolutional autoencoder neural network. To describe the reduced dynamics onto the nonlinear trial manifold, uh, we rely on a deep feed forward neural network. And uh, we also 
employ the encoder function of the convolutional autoencoder in order to obtain higher accuracies, which is confirmed by numerical tests. So a DLROM learns at the same time in an intrusive way, both the nonlinear trial manifold and the reduced dynamics by setting its dimension as close as possible to the number of parameters of the problem. The DLROM architecture employed at training time is the one reported in this slide. So, sorry, Stefania, so what do you mean here by, let's say I have a parametric PD with 10 parameters, you're saying that in the latent space, in the onto code there, I will, I will set the dimensionality of that to 10. We will try to set the latent dimension of it most, po most possible equal to 10. But that's, um, is there a theory for that? Um, because you have a nonlinear, I, right? I mean, the thing about it, in, in Navier Stokes, we don't have, we have three, dim three dimensions plus time, but then a turbulent flow has a dimensionality of 400 to 1,000. Yeah, sure. Humanity. Let's say that uh, the reduced dimension... For linear systems, you can do that, but not for nonlinear systems. Yeah, um, it depends. I will show later that also for some nonlinear system, we can uh, get uh, the reduced dimension, uh, a, very, a very small reduced dimension. Um, however, let's say that uh, the dimension of the intrinsic coordinates is an upper parameter of the neural network. And we try to set it uh, as close as possible to the number of parameters of the problem. Obviously, by fine tuning the neural network, uh, at the end, uh, we choose uh, the uh, reduced dimension, which provide us uh, the best results, which can be larger than uh, uh, the number of parameters of the problem. OK, OK. Thank you. You're welcome. So I was saying that uh, the architecture is composed by three main blocks, uh, the encoder function, the deep feed forward neural network, and the decoder function. So starting from the form solution, it enters uh, the encoder function, and it provides a low dimensional representation of the form. The same parameter instance associated to the form enters the DFNN, and it provides as output the intrinsic coordinates. In this way, the error between the two low dimensional vectors is accumulated. Then the intrinsic coordinates uh, enter the decoder function, and it provides as output the RAM approximation, thus the reconstruction error is obtained. Regarding instead the testing phase, uh, the actual architecture is the one into the red box, into the purple box. That is, at testing time, we discard the encoder function. The first test case I want to show is the 2D figure of a reentry possible cellular mechanism underlying hot tachycardia. The parameter is the Y coordinate of the center of the second applied stimulus. Indeed, we employ this one as two protocol in order to induce the reentry. We started from a form dimension almost equal to 70,000, and we end up with reduced dimension equal to two. The maximum relative error is about 10 to the power of minus five. If we look at the picture um, where we show the trend of the relative error indicator uh, over the testing set versus the CPU time at testing time, it's evident that the DL-ROM outperforms the pod galerkin roms both in accuracy and efficiency. Then we increase the complexity of the problem uh, by considering both re-entry and non-re-entry dynamics. Um, this was achieved by simply enlarging the parameter space. Um, here we have, uh, in order to obtain higher accuracies, we have to move from a form, uh, a reduced dimension for the DL ROM from two to five. And, uh, but even with this dimension, the ROM enables faster testing times with respect to a POD Galerkin ROM, which uh, with a maximum reduced dimension equal to 619. 
Then we perform an error analysis where the error as the definition in the slide, we fix a particular testing parameter instance and we look at the distribution of the error over time, which is almost uniform. And the maximum error is associated to the first time instances, which are the most different over the parameter space. So now- Hold on, hold on a second, Stefania, you're going too fast for us. Okay. Uh... For me, anyways. So, so the error here is actually high at the beginning and at the end of the time. Yes. So, why at the end? Why the why you have a sudden increase at the end? And this is typical of reduced order modeling because uh, at the boundary you don't have, let's say, data close from uh, one side. So it's typical to see that uh, at the bounds of uh, the parameter space, uh, you obtain uh, slightly more uh, higher errors. Because that's something we also see in neural networks and pins also. So that's why I was, I was interested. But can, I, can you go back? At, okay, one more thing here on the, the test time, and I appreciate the uh, difference, but how about the training? You have the training times for DL ROM versus POD Galerian? Um, yes, this is exactly the, the question I was expecting in order to introduce the POD DL ROM. Okay, so you have to thank me for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, okay. So, first uh, I will talk about the benefits, let's say, and then I will come uh, to the training times. The dimension can be kept extremely small. It can be queried at any time instant without requiring the solution of a dynamical system until the time. Indeed, if we are interested in computing, for example, uh, the ROM solution at testing time at final time, the DL ROM speed ups are almost equal to 607,000 with respect to a POD Galerkin ROM and the form. The time resolution is usually larger with respect to the one needed in the numerical solution of dynamical systems. The LROM avoid to use expensive hyper-reduction techniques, and it doesn't require to account for the dynamics of all the field variables. The drawback is that the DLROM depends on NH. And this may lead to long training computational times when the form dimension is large. I want to like that uh, the training times are always justified by the efficiency introduced at testing time, but in order to overcome this issue, we extended the DL ROM to the POD enhanced version. Here, the goal is to approximate the intrinsic coordinates we transpose U, and the per example loss function becomes the one into the slide. The POD DL ROM has the goal to drastically decrease the training computational times. Indeed, by starting from the form solution, the intrinsic coordinates are computed. This is a first layer of dimensionality reduction. And then the POD DL ROM provides as output an approximation of the intrinsic coordinates. Then the ROM solution is recovered by means of the POD basis matrix. So POD DL ROM makes the training phase extremely fast thanks to a prior dimensionality reduction achieved by means of RSVD and thanks to a suitable multi-fidelity pre-training. Pre-training is a form of transfer learning consisting in training a model to solve a simple task and use the optimal weights and biases found on the simple task to initialize the network on a more complex task. We investigate the use of pre-training uh, in the POD DL ROM approach um, on the 3D elastodynamics equations um, where the parameters are the Young modulus and the Poisson ratio. We employ the optimal parameters found on the red task um, to initialize the network on a new configuration where we modify the parameter space. We move from the San Venan Kirchhoff constitutive law to the Neukian one. Now the external applied force is time dependent. First, it was constant, and we enlarge the dimension of the time interval. 
Here on this, this case, I would like to highlight two aspects. The first one is that by means of pre-training, we are able to decrease the total time, I mean training plus validation time of a factor four from almost one hour with the POD diagram to only 15 minutes with the, by the, with the use of pre-training. Moreover, the testing time, and with testing time, I, need, I mean uh, the time needed to compute NT, in this case, NT is equal to 90 time instances for a testing parameter instance is on the scale of milliseconds in contrast to the physical duration of the phenomenon, which is on the scale of seconds. That is, we are able to provide results even faster than real-time solutions. Then coming back to cardiac EP, we consider realistic geometries of left ventricle and left atrium. The parameter is uh, the conductivity in the fibrous direction, that is uh, the capability of the tissue to propagate the electrical signal through the myocardium. If we focus on the LV, in order to train a POD galerkin worm with four clusters, 28 hours are needed. Instead, the POD diagram training computational times, computational time is less than an hour. Both on the LV and the LA, we are able to achieve real-time solutions uh, at testing time. Then another test case regarding the physiological cardiac EP. Stefania, Here, we, we, yeah. we, uh, there's too much information to process. Yeah, uh, please stop me. Let, let me ask you this, uh, and so we can take a breather, is... Uh, the, the POD truncation. Yes. How do you choose it? I know you're very smart. So you, uh, should we rely on, on how smart you are to do that? And then, in other words, the truncation that goes in that first layer, how, how do I know how to choose it and know? Because in principle, POD would, do their role, would play the role that the... Um, certainly, I, I was going to ask you also about kernel POD or kernel PCA, but could play the role that the autoencoder plays. So. So you reduce a little bit and then, but how, how much you reduce and how do you know that? Yeah, let's say that uh, you can, we, what I do normally uh, is uh, to use uh, as a measure, the projection error. And because from my experience, let's say that uh, by means of the POD diagram, uh, you can't uh, go over an overall accuracy in terms of relative errors uh, over 10 to, the 10 to the power of minus three. So normally I set uh, the projection error of the POD to 10 to the power of mi minus four in order to select the number of basis function to retain. Obviously, in addition to that, uh, there is also some experience, but I guess that the, the real answer is the first one. So you're basically saying that you're targeting an error epsilon, which in this case would tend to minus three, and you go an order lower with the projection error, and that's how you collect the how, how many models yeah. Yeah. you in have in the, that... the first layer of POD. Yes, in, in a way in which uh, the overall error of the neural network is not related to the truncation of POD modes. So that you need to know the answer to know the error. Sorry? You need to know the answer to know the error. No, let's say that, uh, uh, no, because I'm saying that normally, usually on the, on, let's say we have uh, tested the POD ideal ROM approach on a very broad range of examples. And we know that usually the accuracy it can get is around 10 to the, 10 to the power of minus three. Okay. okay. It's, it's very general, but, uh, somehow it's uh, something more and so in something less in other cases. So, so I use, uh, starting from this, uh, I compute the projection error over the training snapshots, over the training data set. Okay, so how many modes, did you say how many modes you, put, you kept in the first layer in the previous example? In the beam? Yeah, for example, yeah. 64 for each uh, component of the solution. 64, okay. 
and um, for example in a cardiac EP and the so and the, the and the latent space in the uh, autoencoder was what three three yes you chose you, you, how did you choose the three two parameters plus time which is oh, because you said that's a parameter. okay because you said that's a linear problem and you just take the number of parameters and and the dimensions okay so yes, that goes against my. We also yeah. use the DNU can model, which has uh, is a linear constitutive law. Right, right. Okay. Okay. All please right. stop me every time you have a, a question or a curiosity. The results are impressive, so we just need to understand what's the magic. <laughs> I go ahead. Or... Yes, please. Thanks. I'm sorry, Stephanie. I have a question. Can, can yeah. I ask this question? Yeah. What does N sub H stand for. Sorry, what stands for? No, no, no. Capital N sub H. I think he's talking about the, the, the total number of yeah. FOM yeah. snapshots, right? Here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the thumb dimension? I will ask. Oh. Is the thumb dimension, let's say, the dimension of uh, the semi discretized system? Okay, thank you. You're welcome. This is the finite element, basically, right, uh, yeah. Stefania? Yeah. Yeah, if you use uh, P1 finite element, uh, so. The number of degrees of freedom, yeah. So, Stefania, can I ask you a question here? Yeah. Yeah, so this is Raj from Brown. So, why you have to use POD as a first layer? You can use any uh, layer and can reduce the dimension, any uh, the layer, hidden layer. Yeah, yeah, I can use. Uh, I use POD, but I could use uh, any other sort of dimensionality reduction. It's only a matter of trying to reduce uh, the number, the dimension of the form, which is too big in order to train a network, a neural network in a feasible time. And I want to perform a prior layer of dimensionality reduction. That's okay. it. Okay. And also your training time includes the POD time also. Like Sorry? Computation. Your training time includes the POD also, the time taken by the POD process, the computing the POD. In your training time, it is included. Yeah, it is included, but we are using a randomized SVD, which is very fast in contrast to the exact SVD. Okay. So it's really not substantial. Um, it's very, very low as time. As, as yeah. And how do you sample your parameters? Like, is there like just a random, like selected the parameter randomly or you use some greedy algorithm or something? Um, not a special algorithm has been used in the example I show you, or I only sample uniformly or randomly at this okay. point, okay. but uh, sure can be used uh, more advanced sampling techniques. Okay, thank you, thanks. You're welcome. So on this test case, uh, we, um, solve the binomial equations by means of isogeometric analysis. The parameters are the components of the center of the applied stimulus, which vary in the future region. In this slide, we compare the activation maps for two testing parameter instances. Activation maps are outputs of clinical interest saying to the clinicians at which time the signal arrives at the point. And in particular, I want to highlight that the, the ability of the POD DLROM in replacing the form while computing these outputs of interest. Then regarding times, uh, we are able to train the POD DLROM neural network over the entire parameter space in half the time required to solve the form for a single parameter instance. Then by moving to pathological cardiac EP, here we, considering, we consider the figure of eight reentry and the reentry breakup, possible cellular mechanism for atrial tachycardia, the first and the second for uh, fibrillation. On both cases, uh, we parameterize the location of the second applied stimulus. And uh, by focusing on the figure of eight reentry, the PUD DLROM is able to capture the two main dynamics, um, as well as the shape and the location of the reentry. In the second case, which is a very, very complex, uh, 
due to the chaotic behavior of the solution, we are able to obtain, uh, I would say, um, sufficiently accurate results, uh, even in a case in which the testing parameter instance uh, is closed to a training one, but also in the worst case scenario, which is a testing parameter instance consisting in the midpoint a bit of uh, two training parameter instances. So, Almost one year uh, ago, we start considering uh, a new problems related to the approximation of the behavior of microelectromechanical systems. MEMS are integrated micro devices which combines electrical and mechanical components. Resonators, gyroscopes, micromirrors are examples of MEMS, and in particular, micromirrors are witnessing an explosive growth in recent years due to successful application, uh, applications ranging from LiDAR application for autonomous driving or as projectors of virtual content onto the lenses employed in augmented reality applications. MEMS must satisfy industrial requirements which reflect on the numerical solution of these problems. For example, the complexity of the geometry results in a high dimensionality of the form. The large quality factors involved in MEMS applications entail long transients. And this means that the system must be solved for a very high number of time instances before reaching the steady state. The presence of strong nonlinearities uh, results uh, requires uh, the use of small time step size. The dynamic response is usually characterized by varying the input frequency and the input signal amplitude. So the need and the interest in computing the frequency response function and output of interest. These devices are characterized by large transformations, which are modeled by means of inertial and geometric nonlinearities which turn the behavior of the FRF in a softening or hardening behavior. This means that the solution is no more unique in some frequency regions, so bifurcation requires special treatments. Solving, uh, MEMS, uh, so solving problems related to MEMS application by means of a form is unfeasible. On the other side, we recently uh, employed the PoD Galerkin ROMs for the efficient simulation of MEMS devices. And in contrast to cardiac electrophysiology, using PoD Galerkin ROMs could be a valid and effective option. Indeed, a few from snapshots are, are needed to approximate the linear manifold to compute the linear trial manifold, the resulting uh, ROMs are low dimensional, but there are still limitations. Um, indeed, uh, they are not real time, they are intrusive. Uh, and so the idea was uh, to exploit uh, the benefits uh, introduced by PoD Galerkin ROMs in the diagram frameworks, uh, in the diagram framework. Um, in particular, um, so this is the idea at the basis of the PODG diagram approach. That is, the form, the form is sold for a very small number of parameter instances, small with respect to the number of data required by the neural network to be able to generalize. Then the training phase of the PoD Galerkin ROM is performed. At testing time, we solve the PoD Galerkin ROM, that is, we compute the reduced solution for a very high number of parameter instances in order to generate the training set for the DL ROM neural network, which no longer takes as input um, the intrinsic coordinates, but rather an approximation of them. 
using the periodic alert in ROM reduced solution as input to the DI ROM enables to generate the data set at low cost and higher flexibility in sampling the approximated intrinsic coordinates at particular parameter instances. So here I show the results obtained for MM's micromirror. The external applied force is a body force, which is proportional to the third rotational mode of the system. The parameter of interest are the load multiplier and the forcing frequency. The high accuracy obtained by means of the PODG dl -ROM technique in reconstructing the displacement field allows us to replace the form when computing the FRFs for increasing values of beta of the load multiplier. Here, the control variable is the rotation angle of the plate of the micromirror. Moreover, we are able to compute 60 million of testing parameter instances in less than two minutes by means of the PODG dl -ROM approach. In contrast to the seven hours required by a POD, a classical POD alert in ROM, and 500 days required by a form. So this is often. So I was saying that we are trying to approximate the electromechanical behavior of a MEMS gyroscope. Here, the foam snapshots are obtained by means of a commercial software provided by Coventer. So here we employ the POD diagram technique. The parameters are the frequency and the amplitude of the oscillating signal in the electrostatic forces and the behavior of the solution over the frequency domain is the one close to the red bullet, except for the frequency region associated to this green plateau, where here the 45 degrees rotational mode activates and it starts to interact with the vertical mode. So this can be seen as a first reason in order to understand why from a reduced water modeling point of view, um, at least two latent variables are needed in order to be able to reconstruct the dynamics of the system. Indeed, this is what we analyzed in a recent publication where we focus on the ability of the POD diagram in converging towards the invariant manifolds and in particular towards the intrinsic dimension of the invariant manifolds predicted by the direct parameterization approach, which allows extracting physics-based reduced order models of large finite elements models in nonlinear dynamics. Indeed, if we set the dimension of uh, the POD diagram, the reduced dimension of the POD diagram equal to one, as predicted by the physical and the mathematical theory, this Latin dimension is not uh, able to capture the behavior of the solution. At least two latent variables are needed in order to be able to reconstruct the dynamics. So despite being accurate and extremely efficient, the ROMs uh, as other deep learning based techniques um, lack a rigorous mathematical justification. For this reason, we focus on providing suitable error bounds and analyzing the role played by the hyperparameters defining the neural network architecture. In particular, we focus on the number of dense layers, the width of the dense block, the Latin dimension, the depth of the convolutional block, and the number of channels. So referring to the autoencoder Latin dimension, that is uh, the dimension of the vector of the intrinsic coordinates in the dl -ROM approach, the solution manifold is intrinsically p-dimensional, where p is the number of parameters and time can be treated as an additional parameter. We want to find a low-dimensional representation of the solution manifold in terms of nonlinear reduction. 
that is we want to compress uh, the solution manifold as much as possible without paying in terms of accuracy. And this corresponds to work with the minimal dimension and mean, where delta n is the Kolmogoro, the nonlinear Kolmogoro and width. If the parameter to solution map uh, is Lipschitz continuous, it can be proved that the minimal dimension is bounded by 2p plus 1. If it's continuous and injective near at least a point, then a mean is greater or equal to p. And if it's continuous and injective, then a mean, the minimal dimension, is exactly equal to p. Then a particular class of PDEs has been considered second order elliptic PDEs. And in this case, if the dependence of the coefficients and the boundary data of the PDEs on nu is Lipschitz continuous, then the minimal dimension is bounded by 2p plus 1. Moreover, if the parameter to solution map is injective, then the minimal dimension is exactly equal to p. Then, uh, in order to be, I have, a, I have a question here. The, the uh, because we know we know uh, advection systems, of course. That's where the difficulties with the Kolmogorov uh, in this system. So, are you the theorem here? The first theorem is for any system. Uh, the first one is general, yes. Because you you can have Lipschitz continuous for advection, you know, for hyperbolic clause, but yeah, in this case, it's not, it's not valid. It's not so valid or it's valid? If you want, let's say, if you can't, uh, uh, if the map is not Lipschitz continuous, obviously these results are not valid. No, no, you can have um, holder continuity, which is, yeah, Lipschitz. So, so you do have, uh, this is the Lyon's work, right? So for hyperbolic conservation laws and uh, um, hard to believe that the theorem will apply, but if it's general, it's, it's, I'll, I'll listen to you. Okay. I, I, the the second theorem, I, it's yeah, I would like I would, intuitively, it's good, but the first one, I, I don't know how general that is. Just just the Lipschitz continuity and uh, an injective at one point means that you basically have data at one point. Yeah, and let's say that here I try to. Um report uh, a minimal version of the theorem, uh, it's sure that uh, more assumption can be found in the reference I reported here. Okay, it's interesting, yeah. So I was saying that in order to be able to um, derive suitable uh, error estimates uh, and provide insights on uh, the uh, role and the design of the remaining hyperparameters, uh, we focus on understanding uh, the approximation properties of convolutional neural networks when reconstructing uh, signals, uh, functional signals. As a matter of fact, uh, understanding uh, the properties of uh, deep neural network models uh, stands as the focus of several efforts by the scientific community. A substantial contribution has been provided by Yarotsky 2017, where the, where the mathematical, a rigorous mathematical meaning uh, to NN structural properties such as width and depth has been proved for the approximation of scalar valid maps. This result was later extended by Guring 2020, for example, to the case of different norms. Nevertheless, uh, new approaches are appearing in the literature where NNs are employed in operator learning by either relying on discretization of the output space, such as in Coutinho 2021, or, as in, or by considering continuous functional output spaces, as in Lentler 2022. However, however, at the best of our knowledge, no comprehensive study addressing the approximation properties of convolutional neural networks in operator learning has been provided yet, so we moved in this direction. 
We want uh, we dealt with the derivation of approximation bounds for CNS in operator learning. We want to approximate the parameter to solution map, and uh, this is a, a typical setting uh, in, uh, a, in parameter dependent PDEs by means of a DNN which is comprised of two blocks. The first one is a dense block, and the second one is of convolutional type. That is, the structure is very similar to the architecture of the diagram neural network employed at testing time, but I want to allot that the results I will show refer to general CNNs. So, more precisely, we address the case in which a nonlinear operator maps a finite dimensional input onto a functional space and a DNN is used to approximate a discretized version of the input to output map. Moreover, we are interested in characterizing the approximation error in terms of the DNN model complexity. In order to achieve this goal, we exploit the connection between CNNs and Fourier transform. And we build a CNN model SM that interpolates the discrete map associating the Fourier coefficients to the truncated Fourier series at points xj, where xj is a uniform as a given partition of the domain. So it's possible to describe how to implement SM step by step and also provide interpretation of the typical hyperparameters defining a CNN architecture, such as depth, kernel size, stride, or number of input output channels. And this is what I will show you in the rest of the presentation. So the construction of SM um, is based on three lemmas. The first, starting from the first one, there exists a CNN which is linear, no activation at n level. It, it only employs 1D convolutional and reshaping operations. It has at most six layers. The input and the output uh, channels of uh, the convolutional layers are at most eight, and the kernel size is at most equal to two. Moreover, it maps two k minus one complex numbers to a complex vector of dimension 2k, which is composed by the input itself and the product between each wi and the complex number z ordered in a suitable way. The main mathematical tools we have exploited in order to obtain this result are the embedding of c in R4, reshape operation and ad hoc construction of kernels. For example, if we consider the first layer of the CNN, which is a 1D transposed convolutional layer, we are able to denote uh, all of its specifics, such as the dimension of the weight matrix, there is no bias, the stride is equal to two, we employ the same padding and the dilation is set equal to zero. By, focus, by looking at the definition of the weight matrix, which is obtained by stacking together the convolutional kernels, and it is zero at all but six entries, it's easy to understand the role of the layer F1. Indeed, the first block of the weight matrix mimics the action of the identity matrix, while the second block encodes a two by two matrix representation of the complex number Z. So these two blocks should provide a way to compute the map of interest. Then the remaining layers are used to obtain the desired output, output and they perform suitable summations, adjust the output dimension or sort the entries of the output vector. Lemma two is built on lemma one and it states that there exists a CNN, which is also this time linear, up to reshape operations, uh, it only employs convolutional layers, uh, which have at most eight channels and at input and output, and the kernel size is at most equal to two. That is, these features are inherited from lemma one. Moreover, the depth and the number of active weights depend on the mesh size. 
at omega maps an element of C to a vector, to a complex vector of dimension NH minus one, which is defined as in the slide. Here, we consider K CNNs, where each CNN is defined as in lemma one, and we compose them by setting Z equal to E to the power of I omega H. By composing the K CNN, the depth and the, and the number of active weights grow linearly with K and thus logarithmically with the number of discretization points being K relate, related to the mesh size. Lemma three extends lemma two to the case of 2M plus one Fourier modes in order to build the final CNN model SM. Here, the number of active weights and the number of channels grow linearly with them with the number of modes Moreover, the I component of SM is the truncated Fourier series at point XI. Here, we start by considering 2M plus 1 CNNs, one CNN per mode, and each CNN is defined as in lemma 2. And by starting from these, uh, from these two uh, M plus one CNN, we want to stack them in parallel in order to obtain a single global CNN. To stack two M plus one uh, CNN layers, uh, having C in input channels and C out output channels each, we define a single CNN layer having two M plus one C in input channels and two M plus one C out output channels. Moreover, in order to avoid the introduction of redundant kernels, uh, we constrain the new layer to group its kernels uh, in two M plus one subsets, each of dimension C in. This ensure that uh, we actually stack the output, uh, the output of the original two M plus one original layers as if they work in parallel. That is each one seeing only the path of interest in the input. Then in order to obtain the final uh, CNN SM, uh, we use uh, two other layers. The first one perform, uh, performs some a summation over the 2M plus one output channels. And the second one uh, has the purpose to append a copy of the first element of the output at the end due to periodicity. And in this way, we recover the output dimension NH. So by exploiting the theory developed uh, up to now, we want to derive suitable error bounds for CNNs. In particular, we are able to bound the error, the L infinity norm of the error between a function F belonging to HS and its approximation provided by a CNN C, which is built on top of the previous uh, uh, CNN SM presented in lemma three. And we are able to bound the error by m to the power of one over two minus s. This means that any um, smooth function can be well approximated uh, by C, provided that the neural network is fed with a suitable input. Indeed, the, the proof of this theorem uh, is based on the use of classical estimates for Fourier, for Fourier series but uh, no periodicity assumption is made. And this is motivated by the use of a continuous linear operator T, which maps, which turns F into a periodic signal. This is achieved by squeezing the function and by extending it through Hermit interpolation, thus recovering periodicity. So T turns F into periodic signal and computes the three coefficients of its periodic alias. In this way, we are able to employ classical estimates of free analysis. 
We show we reported the approximation rates uh, obtained by the actual implementation of C. I want to remark that we didn't train the network. Uh, we initialize uh, its parameters uh, with the wish weights and biases. In the first case, S is equal to two. And uh, the error, the case at the expected rate, that is uh, one over the square root of M. And this is regardless of the discretization employed. In the second case, S is equal to two. And once again, the error as the expected behavior. Now we want to extend the previous results, result to the parameter dependent setting. The original and final goal is the approximation of the parameter to solution operator by means of a DNN comprised of two blocks. The first block consists of dense layers um, and has the purpose uh, to, pr to pre process the input. Um, indeed, it takes as input uh, a parameter instance and provides as output uh, an approximation of the Fourier coefficients. The second block is of convolutional type uh, and it is used to obtain the desired output. The convolutional block is designed along the lines of the previous theorem. So, it's possible to characterize the approximation error in terms of the complexity of the deep neural network. In particular, the depth of the dense block depends on the desired accuracy, while the depth of the convolutional block on the mesh size. The number of active weights in the dense layers depend, uh, depends on the regularity of the operator and on P, and finally, a lower number of input and output channels is required in the convolutional block for the approximation of operators whose outputs are highly regular. So in order to confirm the estimates of this result, we perform some numerical tests where we consider the 1D parameterized monodomain equations whose the solution exhibits uh, sharper and sharper fronts as the parameter mu gets smaller. In, uh, in, order to in order to perform and to carry out the numerical experiments, uh, we fix uh, a guess architecture phi1 uh, that serves a starting point, uh, and uh, we train it uh, by minimizing the loss function reported in the slide. I want to highlight that only the parameters of the dense layers are actually updated, while the ones of the convolutional block are kept frozen. After the training, we evaluate phi uh, one on over a testing set of unseen uh, parameter instances in order to compute uh, the error in the green box. Then by exploiting the theorem, we define a second architecture phi two that is uh, twice, as, uh, twice as accurate uh, with respect to phi one. That is, it adds the error over the testing set. So we train phi uh, 2 and we generate phi 3 by iterating the previous steps. The solution of this problem uh, tends to have uh, sharp gradients uh, for certain values of mu, so we set s equal to 1. Moreover, we make the assumption that the parameter to solution map is infinitely differentiable. So the theorem suggests us to quadruplicate the number of channels in the convolutional block and to quadruplicate the number of neurons per dense layer in order to add the error over the testing set. We also increase uh, uh, the number of dense layer of a constant factor equal to one in, when moving from an architecture to a more complex one. The, the, the trend of the error is in accord with the, the theorem, uh, regardless of the initial guess of the, for the architecture. By moving uh, from architecture one to architecture three, the DNN become uh, becomes more and more expressive. And we also show the overall dynamics for two testing parameter instances. And despite the introduction of some numerical artifacts, the DNN is able to capture the general behavior of the solution, both in the hyperbolic and in the diffusive cases. 
In order to remove the spurious oscillation, as suggested by the theorem, a larger architecture can be considered and possibly more training data. So by concluding, the developed techniques enable to solve nonlinear time-dependent parameterized couple PDs in real time for any new parameter-dependent scenario, and also to perform possibly long time extrapolation aspects I didn't uh, go deep, uh, I didn't dive into during this presentation. So generating nonlinear ROMs by means of the algorithms is a feasible way to overcome the bottlenecks shown by traditional linear ROMs. Deep learning based uh, reduced order models are current key ROM techniques for application of interest, which make ROM generation and solution fast, non-intrusive and reliable. Theoretical error bounds for the approximation of nonlinear operators by means of convolutional neural networks have been established and verified, and these resulting estimates provide an interpretation on the role played by the hyperparameters defining a CNN architecture. So with this, I conclude in this last slide, I summarize the publication related to the work I presented, and I would like to thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for the eight minutes of delay. Thank you, Stefania. It was an excellent talk. Hi, uh, my name is Vivek and uh, I am a PhD student working with Professor George Karnadakis. I have a question. So can you please go to slide 10, I think, where you are showing the algorithm? In which I was showing the algorithm? Uh, yeah. Slide 10, she said, it is slide 10. Slide 10. 10. Okay, take a minute. Take a moment. Well, lots of slides. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, just a clarification. So if I understand correctly, you have an encoder to come to the latent space and in the latent space, you are trying to learn the embedding of the function u for the given time and mu mu is the yeah. parameter of the pd so uh, you can so you train for a certain set of t and mu's and you can interpolate or extrapolate for unseen t and mu if that's what i'm correct um let's say that in this configuration i show you we are able uh, to um, for, to compute uh, the rom solution for unseen parameter unseen instance. yes yes but, correct uh, but inside the parameter space. Yes, if we want sure. to extrapolate, mm -hmm. we could use the new TPOD LSTM ROM technique that sure. I didn't show you today, or and okay. for the extrapolation of parameters we are working on with other approaches. Sure. So my question is for all okay. the cases considered, uh, I guess the initial condition has to be the same, right? So the same initial, so when you generate the data set using uh, FEM or numerical methods, you use no, you uh, different T and mu, but uh, the initial condition has to be the same because the latent model doesn't have a provision to take into account change of initial conditions. You can treat uh, initial conditions uh, as parameters, uh, absolutely. Okay. And you can provide so also the mu is uh, the initial condition and the parameters and uh, you can uh, also employ the starting time mm -hmm. okay so you, so the problems the, the test cases you solved had different sets of initial conditions as well no in which in the in the test uh, in the examples i show you no i yeah. didn't treat uh, any initial conditions as parameters but it yeah. can be done. Yeah. Thank it you. You're welcome. Yeah, I see Matthias has a question. Matthias, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks, Stefania, for this uh, really impressive talk. <laughs> In fact, you had a huge number of uh, of, uh, of papers from from this year. So really, <laughs> you are extremely productive. So, <laughs> so my question is, uh, um, it's a bit fundamental. Uh, please excuse. So um, 
I, I mean, you, you mentioned that usually um, the huge systems that you are uh, considering are arising from um, semi discretizations of PDEs. I mean, we have seen this in the examples. Yes. And and if you do this, there are there are two problems. So, so first, these uh, these systems are are very large. Um, this is somehow the the topic that you cheated. But but secondly, it is also well known that these uh, systems are, are very stiff, extremely stiff. And uh, so if you have a traditional method, let's say a grid-based method, then uh, you know that you have to use implicit methods due to the due to the stiffness. Mm -hmm. But but now when you use a let's say a neural network, how how do you deal with the stiffness? How do you have some stabilizers or what is your recipe? Uh, let's say that uh, the recipe is the same. You say that that is. Uh, it depends on the form. I'm interested in the form I provide to the neural network. So I take all the stability problem from a numerical point of view, as we have done uh, for centuries or for, let's say for, for a lot of years. And then I provide uh, the form solutions, uh, the snapshots to the neural network. In what we, have, we did up to now, we didn't try to add some uh, block, some uh, as some uh, architecture in order to start from an unstable uh, solution and trying to stabilize it in the neural network. We only started from stabilized solution. Mm -hmm. Okay. It can be done, I guess, but we didn't <laughs> do it with it uh, yet. I, th I think this would be an interesting uh, question to yeah, the community, absolutely. how to stabilize, uh, numerical stabilize in a neural network. Yeah, indeed you are not the first person asking me this question. Ah, okay, so, sorry. <laughs> so you are well prepared. <laughs> <laughs> but let's say there is interest. Oh, thanks a lot. You're welcome. Stephanie, in, in the, uh, in the proofs for the CNN, yes. the, the input space for the functions, was it a compact space or was it an open space? Uh, the input space is compact and it's the parameter space, while the functional space is HS. Right. Where did you use the, where, where did you use the compactness? Uh, uh, because the, uh, in the theory, in the, in the paper of Lant, uh, Taylor, he removed that assumption. Where did you use the, the, uh, the compactness it's, assumption? It's required uh, for the dense part uh, in uh, the last theorem, uh, which is based uh, on uh, Yarotsky results. Okay. The Yarotsky results is good, but it's, it's not uh, sharp at all. You apply it, uh, we, we try to apply it, it's really, really not sharp. Regarding the dense part, uh, we exploited them. Yeah. All right. say novelty of the work uh, stands uh, in the convolutional part, uh, in the approximation uh, of, uh, of a nonlinear operator by means of CNNs. There, there is a similar work by Stefan Malad for the linear layers on the, when you do the Fourier. Uh, mm -hmm. analogy have you seen that work no he did that a long time ago actually okay. he analyzed uh uh very systematically cnns using uh but but the linear linear cnns can you repeat the name please it's a it's one of the pioneers in wavelets stefan malat ah, okay. -L 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 -T. Okay. yeah i get yeah my sorry, my French is not good, and my Italian is bad also. So, <laughs> no problem. Do I have Do we have any more questions for our speaker? Okay, thank you, Stephanie. And sorry, I, I interrupted you. I I didn't know that I was on mute. No, sorry, yeah. not a problem. Thank uh, you. It was a pleasure. Sure. Thank you. Molto, molto grazie. <laughs> Prego. <laughs> Okay, uh, so like I was saying, we started the YouTube channel for quant seminars and starting from last week, we upload the recordings of seminars to the YouTube channel uh, such that people can watch them directly online. 
and I'll put the link to the uh, YouTube channel in the chat later. Okay, so let's move to our second talk. Our second talk is given by Dr. Panos Patidis from New York University, Abu Dhabi. Uh, Dr. Patidis obtained his bachelor in civil engineering from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, Greece in 2015. In 2019, he obtained his PhD in civil engineering from the University of Massachusetts. He then worked as a senior engineer in the uh, New York office of an engineering consulting firm. And Dr. Benditis is now a postdoctoral research associate at New York University Abu Dhabi working on computational solid mechanics and machine learning. So without further ado, uh, welcome panels, and you may start your presentation. Uh, thank you, Songren, for the kind introduction and uh, hello, everybody. So first of all, uh, let me share my screen and uh, make sure that you can all see it in full screen. Yeah. So can you all see my screen? In full yeah. Size? yeah. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so thanks again, everybody, for attending my talk. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking also Professor Karnyadakis uh, for inviting me here today and giving me the opportunity to present our work uh, in front of this very special audience. And I would also like to mention the name uh, and thank my collaborator and supervisor, uh, Dr. Mustafa Mobasan, with whom we have been working on this project for the last uh, several months. Uh, and please, if you have any questions, if I'm speaking you know, too quickly, please raise your hands. You can jump at any time and ask uh, for any clarifications. I would be very happy to, to answer. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, my talk today is about the first step of a broader effort. So let me begin first with a broader effort. I'm coming from a mechanics background with civil engineering and material science. And uh, one of the main goals of our group is to accelerate the numerical solution of nonlinear computational solid mechanics problems. Now for this type of problems, uh, the community has been heavily, heavily relying on the finite element method for several decades. But now we would like to see what machine learning can do to help us do better than that. But, and this is the key point, uh, we would like the two methods, FEM and machine learning, to work cooperatively with each other, not in isolation. So bottom line, we don't want to replace and throw away FEM, we just want to enhance it. Therefore, we will still preserve the overarching scheme of finite elements, but we will intervene strategically within the FEM group, plug in a machine learning model, and see what could be the benefit of that. So to this end, uh, we recently established this uh, framework and we coined the term IFEM, which stands for Integrated Finite Element Neural Network, pretty straightforward. Uh, and as I said today, I will be talking about the first step, uh, which is the application of IFEM in the field of continuum damage mechanics. So this is my outline. Uh, first, I will give you the big picture of IFEM. I will talk about what motivated uh, this effort and uh, give you an overview. And then, and this will be the main part of the talk, uh, the application of IFEM to uh, CDM, CDM standing for continuum damage mechanics. And then I have included just a slide, uh, you know, mainly to stimulate the discussion for what's next and discuss a little bit of our uh, ongoing work. So uh, let's begin. And the motivation, I always begin the motivation why we do uh, what we're doing is simple. Uh, Nonlinear FEM analysis take a lot of time. Sometimes this, exp uh, this expense is just prohibit, especially when we're talking about uh, the industry. So parameters such as uh, when you have problems that are multi-physics, uh, they are multi-scale, they have a non-local nature, or when we're using you know, a very fine discretization, uh, when you have material failures, structural failures, all these problems, uh, what's happening is that the nodal degrees of freedom, the vector of the nodal degrees of freedom changes, it, it, it increases a lot in size, because you have to account for all these additional governing PDEs and you have to do the, the finer mesh resolution. And as a consequence, the Jacobian matrix of the system, the Jacobian matrix of your domain also increases. Now, it is the inversion of this large Jacobian matrix that kills the computational time. And in schemes such as the full Newton Raphson, which are both incremental and iterative, which means you need to invert the Jacobian within each iteration of each increment, then the computational cost becomes uh, just too much to afford. So our focus, and we we'll start to you know slightly and gently point towards the direction that we're moving, our focus will be on the Jacobian matrix and how we could reduce uh, the complexity of the problem while still maintaining the physics. So if we look inside uh, the finite element loop, uh, let's talk about the Newton-Raphson in a displacement uh, load setting. 
And what's happening is that first we begin the analysis and we apply the displacements at the boundary of the essential nodes. And then we dive into the finite element level and we use the element nodal uh, solution with the material model at hand to calculate the state variables, uh, stresses, history, output, uh, the residual, and the Jacobian. We invent the Jacobian, solve for the unknown displacements, check convergence, and repeat the inner loop until we obtain convergence for this specific increment. And then we move on to the next one until the end of the analysis. So where do we intervene? We will intervene within, inside the finite element level, and we will plug in a pre-trained neural network with a goal to approximate the solution of a field variable that otherwise would be treated as an ordered degree of freedom. So the input of this network would be the displacement vector, the displacement field, and the output, the output now depends on what is the problem-specific PDE that we're trying to solve. So it depends on the problem. But the output, in any case, will be used into the calculation of the state variables of interest, residual and Jacobian. And therefore, this information will be embedded in these variables. But, and this is the key point, without numerically solving, without treating them as nodal degrees of freedom, uh, this specific field, this specific uh, field variable. So to put uh, even more context and uh, disassociate the two functionalities, we will allocate the solution of the displacement vector for the traditional finite element method. We will still be using safe functions, uh, calculate Jacobian and residual, invert the Jacobian and solve for the incremental change of displacements. This is there. But at the same time, additional and governed PDAs that increase the complexity, we will throw them to the uh, neural network and try to approximate the solution while still use that output into the calculation uh, that takes place in the upper part. So potential applications. Uh, Andros, can you, can, can you, uh, uh, there's a lot going on in that loop. So the, sure. uh, yes. here, so actually, yeah, that, uh, so you use the basis, everything. So the neural network does what? Maybe in the next, on the next slide, you can tell us precisely what the neural network does. Exactly. Takes, uh, you said it takes replacements is... as inputs, yeah? This will be the majority of my talk. What is exactly the functionality of the uh, neural network input, output, and how everything is calculated. But just to give you uh, another idea of this slide, the input of the network is the displacement vector. So the coordinates of my Gauss points and the displacements, displacement in terms of strain. So it's going to be the strain field, actually. And the output in the specific implementation of IFEN, which is for continuum damage mechanics, the output will be a non-local strain field because the problem that we are targeting and I will be talking about today is a non-local gradient-based continuum damage model. Right. So, so, so the, uh, so is it <laughs> the, the, the neural network does a, a a map? Exactly, it does a mapping. But not at the operator level, uh, not at the parallel level at the function. So it's a function. At the function level. Exactly. Okay. We're, and still, it's we're still talking about on the on the function level. So uh, it's pre-trained. Uh, when you say pre-trained, parameterized. Oh, I, okay. Maybe I, I, it's it's coming up. So I understand. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'm smiling because uh, the answers to all these questions exist in the following slides. But I, I'm really glad that you already have uh, these questions. Uh, so I say pre-trained because we do offline the training of the network and then we plug it in. Yes, if we're talking about the function level, not the operator level yet. Um, and three, yes, it does this transformation from the local strain field to the non-local strain field, but I will be talking in more detail uh, in the next slides about the uh, how, how it's integrated in the finite element level computation. Okay, so the problem that actually uh, I will be targeting today is this problem of non-local damage. Uh, the top equation is the equilibrium. FEM will take care of that. And now you have an additional governing uh, PDE, where on the right-hand side, you have exactly what we described before, the local strain field. On the left-hand side, you have this non-local strain field, and you have the Laplacian operator uh, to, you know, in, in, in this equation uh, as well. So this is what the network will take care of. The input will be the local strain. The output will be the non-local non strain plus something else. I will get back to this something else in a while. And the output will be used in the equilibrium equation above. The integration, everything will become clear in a few more slides. 
But as I said, we can go into even more complicated problems. Uh, for example, when we have additional governing PDEs, we have additional field variables. As long as the input is the strain field, you know, the displacements that we will solve for numerically with FEM, then we can use uh, this concept of uh, IFEM in even more complicated uh, cases. But for now, and for the rest of the presentation, I will be talking in more detail about this case here of non-local damage. Okay, so now actually let's move to the specific implementation. And for the people of the audience who are not very familiar with the field of uh, continuing damage, uh, I will make a brief introduction. So in this context of continuing damage, uh, we model cracks, not as uh, openings, but as material zones that have a reduced stiffness. Now, the magnitude of this stiffness loss is given by a variable called damage, called D, distance for damage. And D takes values between 0 and 1. So if D is 0 at a material point, then this material point is intact. I have no damage. If D is 1, then I have a fully damaged state and I cannot take any more stresses. OK. And damage is a function of the strain. So the higher the strain, the higher the deformation, uh, this is what drives the damage. Okay, so there are three prevailing methods in this field. The first one is called local damage method, and it's essentially exactly what it described. For each Gauss point, for its integration point, separately, you find the displacements. From the displacements, you calculate the strains, and from the strains, you calculate the damage. Straightforward, simple as that. Now, the problem with this method is that it gives mass dependent results. So the finer the mesh, the higher the resolution, you know, the smaller the element uh, length, then the more localized your damage gets. And this may give you completely different results depending on the mesh resolution that you're using. So this is what I illustrate here. Uh, I have created you know, a, a, single, a single domain. I have my initial crack here. I'm just pulling upwards and downwards. Therefore, this is a mode one uh, failure. So I expect damage to propagate from right to the left. By the way, can you see my cursor while I'm pointing? Yes, we can see. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Perfect, thank you. So in the case of the coarse mesh, where I'm using large elements, uh, curve, the, the green curve will describe the performance. I do have damage, but I have not reached the capacity. If I do an intermediate uh, scale mesh resolution, I hit the capacity at point B, whereas if I have a very fine mesh resolution, you get the capacity at point C. So, it's completely dependent on the method I'm using. And of course, this is impractical for the industry. It can get accurate if you calibrate the length of the element, but this means that you have to calibrate your model again and again for the specific problem that you're solving. Still though, this method is the fastest. Uh, and ideally, this is how, you know, the, the least expensive that uh, it can get. The next method is a non-local method, which is called non-local integral damage method. In this case, you're doing exactly the same as before. So you calculate at each Gauss point, your strain, your local strain, and your local damage variable. And then you go over again at each Gauss point, and you're doing an average of what's happening in the vicinity of that particular Gauss point. You apply a weight function. I mean, the integral will, uh, will end up being a summation uh, of of, a, of products of the weights and the local damage that you have in the vicinity. The, the length of uh, you know, the area that you're looking for um, is defined by this parameter LC called, called characteristic length. It is essentially a measure of how diffused your damage is. And this is how you calculate now a non-local strain or a non-local damage. Now, uh, this uh, method will yield mass independent results. So this is good. But at the same time, you have to do the search for all the Gauss points, keep track of and update uh, matrices that keep track of the strains and the local damage and update them at each increment and each iteration. Uh, of course, the search is not very accurate when you go to the boundaries and different edges. And there are also some more uh, issues with the definition of the tangent of the, the Jacobian, which gives, which leads us to the third method. And this will be the main focus. This is called the non-local gradient method. And on top of the equilibrium equations that I have on the left, I have this additional PD. This is the PD that maps the local equivalent strain field to a non-local equivalent strain field. This is the Laplacian operator, and G, G is nothing more than uh, the characteristic length that I mentioned in the previous slide, squared over two. Again, it's a measure of how diffused 
uh, the normal locality pH. Now, in the conventional method of the non-local gradient, if we discretize it using safe functions and arrive at the system of equations that we need to solve, we need to solve for the x and the y displacements at each node and for the non-local strain. So the non-local strain is treated in the conventional way as an additional nodal degree of freedom, which means we have a larger Jacobian. If I didn't have this delta epsilon, I would only have J U U, which is the Jacobian just for the displacements. Now I have this additional three terms, and it is the inversion of this larger Jacobian that will increase the computational cost of the non-local grid. Panos, can, I, can I make a comment about the, and I'm not in the field, Sorry. but uh, uh, yes. on the, uh, the, I understand exactly how this, uh, this uh, method uh, uh, spreads the, uh, the, the discontinuity around it, uh, but wouldn't that uh, a, a fractional a Laplacian uh, do a better job in, in this non-locality uh, with a fractional operator or, or like a tempering fractional derivative so you can control the horizon like they do in, hydro, in uh, periodynamics? Uh, because, uh, because so here you use, use G to do that and then you sort of have to say if, if it's time dependent problem, if it's quasi static is fine. If it's time dependent, then you have to say, okay, now I have this diffusion length at that time, but then I have also this, the real time progresses. <clears throat> so, so, uh, but, but, so that would be, a, I, I think for a steady state, it wouldn't matter for a time dependent case, a fractional PDE here, I would play a better role as a non-local model. Uh, so this is a very good point. Uh, let me say that first, uh, G is typically treated as a constant, uh, even though it can be time dependent, depending on you know how what are the material properties, because this is a material property. So it depends on also the domain that you're analyzing. Uh, and actually, this is why uh, in the formulation of the pin, we don't only pass as information the coordinates and the local stream, but we also pass G, even though for the time being is not uh, is not changing. Uh, the method that we are trying to improve and serves as a basis to showcase, or at least to examine and see uh, if IFEN works or not, uh, it arrived at this formulation several years ago, and actually since then it has been uh, governing this, this field. Now, I'm not very familiar with periodynamics, uh, to be honest, and I'm sure that there would be other ways, even with phase field or with, as you said, periodynamics to, to, to spread out this discontinuity and uh, not have to go into this higher Jacobian. Uh, but my answer at the end of the day is that the main purpose of, of this is to have an example that is well bounded. It has a specific PD, it has a specific boundary conditions expression, and we can take it and see if the overall concept that we're trying to um, establish works or not. So I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I was just commenting actually on the model itself. It could be periodynamics, which is does have derivatives, or it could be fractional derivative, which plays the same role, but it's a different yeah. model. So, but but for the it doesn't affect the machine learning part. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, hi, panels. Ah, yes. Hi. Sorry. Um, my name is Andrew, and I'm a PhD student from Brown. And I'm wondering whether the stress here. As it's showing the sigma on the left is the just the conventional definition of the local stress or some non-local stuff. Is the local the stress case. local? So in this setup, there is nothing related to like non-local stress, right? Just the non-local strain as shown in the middle. Uh, no, it's uh, it's calculated it's, at its Gauss point separately, and mm -hmm. it's local. In this context, it is treated as a local variable. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. As I said, feel free to ask uh, uh, anything. So at the end of the day, this is the, the goal. We want to replace this PD. I mean, excuse me, we want to approximate the solution of PD and not having to explicitly and numerically uh, solve for that. Which brings me to this slide uh, that shows the setup of the uh, IFN as it stands right now. So it has two steps. The first one is the offline training of the pin that will learn this transformation from the local to non-local. As you can see, the input are for each Gauss point coordinates, the G variable, and the local strain. The output is, of course, the non local strain. And this is what I was holding on for before the partial derivative of the non local strain with respect to the local. You will see in a few slides why this is a very important output. Thanks to domatic differentiation, we can uh, calculate it very easily, but you will see why we need it. And once we have learned this transformation, 
again for a single geometry and for a single time increment. So I, I need to bound the space of uh, and not you know uh, at the end of the day where we stand right now we are solving at a specific time increment for a specific uh, problem for a specific geometry and loading conditions. I have included some slides that give away our first efforts to generalize and you will see the results. But for the time being, please bear in mind that uh, we're talking about a single uh, time. Step. And then once we have completed the offline training, as I said at the very beginning, we dive into the element level computations where we know the displacements and the strain, use the pin to find those two variables, and then calculate a non-local damage based on the non-local strain and use the non-local damage and this partial derivative in the definition of R and J. R stands for the residual, J stands for the Jacobian. Then we will assemble to the global stiffness, to the global uh, Jacobian, invert and move on. And so for displacements, update and move on. So of course, what I haven't said yet is what is the calculation of R and J? This will take place in three slides from now. But this is the setup of Python. Offline training, use plugin exactly in, for each finite element separately and calculate the residual and the, and the Jacobian uh, in this way. So now let's look a little bit deeper into the pin. Uh, I'm sure that everybody in the audience is familiar with pins, so I'm not going to explain uh, the functionalities. I'm just going to make it more specific to our case. So I already said that the input is x, y coordinates, z, and local strain. Here I'm just showing two nearest two layers. Of course, I'm using a deeper and wider. This is just for clarity. Output is the non-local strain, and the first and the second order uh, partial derivatives of the non-local strain with respect to the coordinates, because we need the second order derivatives for the governing PDE, and we need the first order derivatives for the PDE uh, in the boundary conditions as the boundary uh, expression, and the second the, and the first order derivative of the non-local strain to the local. This will be used for the calculation of the Jacobian. A few points. Uh, first of all, the loss function is a summation of the L2 norms of the PDE and the boundary conditions. The weight of each term is one. We don't apply different weights for the time being. The collocation points that uh, the pin community is, is using for us are the Gauss points. This is where we evaluate the PDE. And the boundary conditions is evaluated on the boundary nodes. Another important thing is that we don't use any label data to guide the solver. We're just relying on what the PDE of the Gauss points and the boundary condition expressions can do. And I think the last thing that I would like to say is that the local strain is in the order of 10 to the minus four, five, six, seven, eight, you can go even, even below that. Uh, whereas X, Y, and Z depend on the units of the problem. Now, this creates a separation of scales that makes the training harder. And actually, it's one of the things that we're currently looking at in more detail. What would be the appropriate input data scaling techniques that can bring everything uh, within the pin context uh, to speed up and help the network essentially learn better and faster? For the time being, I'm just multiplying the local strain with a factor of 10 just to you know, increase the values a little bit. And then at the end, I will divide the non-local strain with the 10 just to uh, undo the scaling. It's, it's a simple decimal scaling technique. Uh, but as I said, this is one of the things that we are looking at right now, you know, the, the more systematic um, scaling of the input data. But this is how the training is done offline. And now let's move on to the calculation of the residual and the Jacobian. So we begin with a strong form of the governing PD of equilibrium, sigma ij. Uh, one minus d is, as I said, in this context of CDM, the multiplier of uh, my material properties times the stiffness matrix times the strains. The weak form using safe the test functions after integration uh, by parts will lead to these expressions with external stresses and the internal stresses. And upon discretization using the safe functions and the safe function derivatives, we arrive at the expression of the residual. Uh, this is pretty standard uh, in, the world of, uh, in the world of mechanics. There is nothing really new here. And by the way, I'm calling this term B transpose, which is the safe function derivatives, one minus D, CHKL times B as K. Uh, K times U is this uh, term here. So what's new is on this slide here. At the end, I have to solve this expression at the, at the top, J times delta U equal minus R. So I need to solve for the incremental change of displacements. 
And I know that the residual is given by k times u. So j the Jacobian, we know that it's partial r over partial u. So it will be k times partial u over partial u equals unity. So you have k, k of u plus the partial derivative of k with respect to the nodal displacements times the displacements. Excellent. For its finite element, the k term, which is here, I know the same function derivatives. I know, see, this is the stiffness, uh, the stiffness matrix of the element. 1 minus d, well, d is given by the governing damage law. So for a specific material, we use uh, the damage law that best describes. So the input in this damage law is the strain, local or non-local. In this case, since we have already done the offline training of the team, we plug in the non-local strain, then we calculate the non-local damage. So this is known. And if we know k for each finite element, we know k for all the elements. Partial k over partial u essentially uh, leads to this partial d over partial u as the more challenging uh, calculation. And for this calculation, for this computation, we're using the chain rule. And in this chain rule, our goal, and this is the, the most important thing, we try to reflect all the dependencies, all the steps that took us from the nodal displacement to the damage. So we express these dependencies as uh, an implication of these derivatives. The first one is partial d over partial non-local. Well, since we know the damage model, we get a derivative, and therefore we know the dependence of damage to the non-local strain. This is also straightforward. Then we have partial non-local strain with respect to partial local strain. What was the thing that took us from the local to the non-local strain? It was the pin. This is why it's, I'm, I'm, I'm calling here as the pin output. And this is why, as I said at the beginning, we don't only need the non-local strain, but in order to close the loop and calculate correctly the Jacobian, we also need the partial derivative of the non-local strain with respect to the input of the local strain. So this is the term here that essentially restores all the steps from the displacements to the damage. Now, the third and the fourth term are also straightforward. Uh, this is the partial of local strain with respect to the tensorial. Uh, this depends on how we have defined the equivalent strain. Uh, there are several models uh, that are appropriate for different materials. And the last term is the tensorial over the displacements, which is nothing more than the same function derivative. So based on all those models and the pin, we can calculate this partial derivative for each finite element. And therefore, if we, you know, uh, use the connectivity matrix, we can do that for uh, all the... Banners, how do you do the first term? Because the first term is uh, uh, the uh, epsilon bar is the neural network output. But how do you take the yes. derivative of a uh, of the D, which I guess is expressed in finite element basis, right? So there is so an with equation... With respect to the, uh, uh, the neural network uh, quantity. So let me clarify this. Uh, the damage depends on the strain that you're using to calculate it. We're using an expression of the damage law that is appropriate for a material, for a specific material. But what we plug in is the non-local strain. Still, though, we can get the partial derivative of this expression. It's whether we are using the local or the non-local. The okay. So, are you same. doing this with uh, with uh, with automatic differentiation, the first one? No, no. This is just the expression of an equation that has on the on the left damage, on the right the strain. Okay. Okay. Okay, I, the, 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 I, the, see, the, I see, I see, I remember, I remember the equation before, yeah, yeah, fine. Uh, yes, what is what comes as the automatic differentiation is the second term. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. 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 And by the way, uh, the pin focuses just on the transformation between the strings. There's no damage in the pin. I just want to uh, add this clarification. So at the end of the day, we know all the terms. Uh, and I want to emphasize that J is in the order of u. u are just the nodal displacements x and y in case of 2D problem. Which brings me to this uh, table that has a comparison of all the methods this far. In the local case, if I have n nodes in a 2D problem, I have two n degrees of freedom. This is the residual. This is the Jacobian. Okay. In the non-local gradient, I have this additional degree of freedom, the non-local strain. I have an additional expression for uh, the residual of the non-local strains. Therefore, I'm calculating a bigger Jacobian. Whereas in the proposed method of the Eiffel, in this context, I'm restoring the size of the equations, of the system of equations, back to the local case. But, and this is the, the key difference, the residual and the Jacobian embed information that has come through um, 
the implementation of the pin. So this is it with uh, the math behind uh, the method. Now let's move on to the examples and see uh, what, we, what we have done. So the first case uh, is a single notch, uh, mode one testing. Uh, this is the geometry. This is my initial crack. This is the initial opening. I'm pulling it uh, upwards and downwards. And since this is symmetric, I will only analyze the upper half. So first of all, I need to make sure that our in-house non-local gradient solver will yield indeed mass independent results uh, as I promised at the beginning. So everything here is FEM, nothing is with uh, the proposed method. So I am changing the element uh, size. I'm using 58 in the 100 elements per side for this domain. I, I'm calling these models coarse, intermediate, and fine. And here you can see the reaction versus the normalized uh, force, applied force uh, curves. Essentially, they overlap. So this is the first sign that we have mass independent results. And here on the right, you can see uh, for two load factors that exist in the damaged uh, regime at LF 0 0.7 and 0 0.82, uh, what the non-local damage profile, uh, profile uh, looks like. I have zoomed in a little bit, just you know, for uh, <laughs> excuse me, for more for more cl clarity. So essentially, you can say that uh, regardless of the mess, I have the same uh, diffusion of damage. So I do have um, the mess independent solver that I promised at the beginning. Now, how we implement the model? We will use the non-local gradient method to take us up until the previous load increment. And then we're going to switch. We will move on to the next increment, plug in just the uh, local strain. I mean, once we calculate with the application of the displacement of the essential boundary, find the, you know, complete the load that I described above and see the main thing. If the residuals are decreasing, which is the main criterion for convergence in the numerical analysis we're doing. Which brings me to this uh, slide. So on the top left, you can see the target values. This is the true non-local strain field that we're trying to uh, approximate. Here you can see the predictions of the trained pin uh, for the non-local strain. And by the way, this is for the elastic load factor. I, I had to say that before, I'm sorry. Where we will be looking results at three load factors, 0 0.42, which is in the elastic, 0 0.7, which is in the inelastic ascending, and 0 0.82, which is in the inelastic descending branch. So this is our target. This is the product uh, after training of the pin. And here I just indicate the relative squared error uh, of the strains capped at 0 0.005. And you can see that we can uh, approximate the solution of the normal strain field uh, pretty well. And here I'm just listing the hyperparameters <coughs> for the training of the networks. What's even more important, I mean, this is the first encouraging sign that we can use that specific setup to compute the, the, the transformation. What, what is even more important is the fact that the residuals that I'm plotting on the bottom, they are indeed converging. So on the left, you have this, the residuals uh, of the FEM. The red line corresponds to the internal stresses, P times sigma, say function derivatives times the stresses. Uh, and the blue curve corresponds to the incremental change of the displacement. Our convergence criterion is the blue curve to have dropped at least six orders of magnitude. And this is the most robust way that we can guarantee uh, that uh, the nonlinear FEM analysis that we're doing is actually uh, has then the equilibrium state. These are the uh, residuals that we calculate with our method solving just for a 2n by 2n. Nothing is 3n the same way that it's on the left, uh, both for the internal stresses and for the displacements. So A, we do get uh, the decrease that we were hoping for. And B, even, even more encouraging, we get it in just uh, two iterations, which is the bare minimum, because we have to calculate at least uh, two points for the blue curve. So now I will move on to the next load factor uh, with a similar setup. On the top, you will see the non-local strains. Again, we're calculating very pretty accurately, and these are the relative square term for the non-local strains. But now I have moved on to the inelastic regime. So now I can calculate damage. Uh, so in the middle, you can see how the non-local damage profiles look like. And again, this is the relative squared error for the damage. Uh, this white space is because I have zero over zero, so it's not defined. And you can see that uh, we're doing pretty well. Again, the, the, the residuals are decreasing. I just want to point out here that there is this region on the bottom left uh, that has slightly higher than the slightly 
has a higher than the 0 0.005 uh, threshold that we can put. I would like to point out that you know, this is the region that is completely unloaded. So when we are uh, stretching the domain, uh, the crack tip is here, where you see the, the red colors. Everything behind it is doesn't contribute at all. It's uh, the strains here are in the order of 10 to the minus 7, 10 to the minus 8. So it makes sense for the network to not be able to calculate at the same accuracy uh, values which are in the order of 10 to the minus 7 versus values which are in the order of 10 to the minus 3 or 4. And this is why the relative square error in these cases is expected to be uh, higher. At the same time, this is not the driving factor. This is not the driving force of the crack. This is why we care more about what's happening at the crack tip and ahead. So this is for the load factor 0 0.7. Uh, moving on to the last load factor of 0 0.82. Again, uh, this is more pronounced here, this area, but we're going to uh, repeat what I just said. Here you have the non-local strains, the non-local damage, and again, uh, the convergence of the residuals. So these three slides uh, hopefully give us some confidence that uh, we have a rigorous mathematical formulation that can stand. And I'd just like to emphasize again, here we are solving a 2n by 2n versus a 3n by 3n. And actually today we got the, um, the reviewers' comments because we submitted this paper a few months ago. Uh, and one of them was about the computational efficiency and the computational gain. So I want to point out the following just as a clarification point. The computational benefit that we are targeting comes from the reduction of the system of the Jacobian. Therefore, I cannot right now compare computational times because I'm still doing it at you know, specific time slots. Once I'm able to find an operator or something more universal uh, that can run the entire analysis on its own, then we will still be able, then we will be able to compare directly uh, computational times. For the time being, now, though, now we know that uh, the computational gain comes from the guaranteed solution of the smaller Jacobi. Panos, to that end, uh, don't you think that the, you can replace uh, pins with uh, depot net, physics informed depot net, for example? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I have spent quite some time working, I mean, reading this paper and uh, thinking along this direction. Uh, I know that they are more universal, but we had to start from somewhere. So we had to. Um, first, make sure in this, I'm not going to say simplified, but I'm going to say uh, in this context, uh, which is one level below, uh, that the method works. If we didn't get the residuals converging, then there would be no point in the discussion. Uh, now that we are moving on to more general approaches, I think uh, actually variational deep on nets uh, could be even, even a, a very good fit for this approach. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, yeah, some data has been working on that. Yeah. Yes, actually, I was reading that paper a few hours ago with the uh, with cracks and the uh, Facebook. So, uh, very good work, by the way. Uh, Thank you. So now, uh, as I said, we are training and testing on the same thing. Now let's try something a little bit more ambitious. Uh, we will try to just look at the end goal here. Train a pin on the course mesh and apply in final discretizations. So the benefit would be to train a network well enough quickly with a smaller data set size, and then apply it in cases that we have, uh, that we cannot avoid the finer uh, mesh resolution. So what I'm showing you here is there is, are the results. Everything is on local strain, nothing is damaged. Uh, of the pin that is trained on the coarse mesh and tested on the intermediate one. For the load factor of the elastic, first in elastic and second in elastic. Everything is intermediate because everything is uh, here are the true values, here are the predicted, these are the, the errors. Uh, we see that we can, of course, there are more increased errors uh, on the bottom left uh, corner where we expect them to be, which get a little bit more pronounced when we go to the fine. So let me go to the next slide. This is exactly the same setup, but applied in the even finer mess. Uh, but qualitatively, I would like to say also quantitatively, because this is where the crack TP exists. Uh, in the area that we care about, I think we are doing uh, a decent job. Now, just a comment. Um, I'm going to go back and forth between those two slides, and I would just like to emphasize that as I was looking on the, you know, the valleys and everything, how the landscape looks, uh, I realized that the pattern here is quite similar. It's just 
when you apply you know, a final message, you populate and you have more Gauss points, uh, you expect to have an increased error in the areas that you are already doing not so well. So this is why you will see the pattern of the yellows here in the intermediate and the fine pretty similar and slightly more um, pronounced in the case of the fine. So this is the first glance towards the generalization across different uh, messes, but still we cannot know. Uh, this doesn't uh, we can claim success, but it shows some promising signs. The next effort of generalization goes uh, with respect to different time increments. Again, I'm using the fully connected. I'm not doing uh, any RNNs uh, or anything like that. I'm just, in this case, training on four elastic load increments at 0 0.1, 2, 3, and 4, testing in between 0 0.25. This is not extrapolation. It's inter interpolation, but on unseen data. Uh, I think we are doing uh, a good job. And again, here I'm zooming in, and I actually show you uh, for the Gauss points and one-to-one -one comparison of what's happening for the true, predicted, and uh, relative squared and error. And this is the, the graph here. So we can see that uh, we can capture pretty well uh, in this setup. Something similar uh, could be said for the cases of the inelastic. So in this case, I'm training on four inelastic load factor uh, values, testing again in between, and seeing how well we're doing. Of course, we're doing not as well as in the other cases, uh, but still in the area that we're more, most interested uh, about, uh, we, we can capture pretty well um, the landscape. So these are the results for the single notch case. Uh, the second, uh, using a structured mesh. So one crack and structured mesh. The second problem that we uh, applied IFEN is uh, this domain here, fixed on the bottom, stretching uh, on top with two crack, with two initial cracks. And the purpose was to see if the pin during training can understand the presence of two regions where strains are localized. And uh, or if it's, you know, we just wanted to, to, to explore the, this aspect as well. So I'm still using the structured mess. As you will see, I'm doing one step at a time, uh, but this is with um, the two cracks. I'm using two idealizations of mess called coarse and fine. Again, these are the reaction uh, load factor values. The curves overlap, so we do uh, repeat. Uh, you know, the, we establish that we have a mesh independent FM solver. And now I'm moving on to the results of the non local strain and the damage uh, for this case at load factor 0 0.45, which is at the peak, and uh, we have damage on both sides, as well as 0 0.7. I would say that we have pretty uh, similar conclusions. The residuals are, are converging, not as fast as before. So in the single case, if you had noticed, it took more steps for the FEM solver to find, to, to meet the convergence criterion uh, and less and fewer for the um, IFEN. In this case, especially for that case, IFEN is taking a little bit more iterations, uh, but again, it's a comparable size. And we are able to find uh, the location of both uh, localizations. And the third and final example that I will uh, show you is uh, this example of an L-shaped geometry. It's fixed on the left. I'm pulling downwards on the right. So I expect the crack to propagate in this direction. And uh, the new thing about this mesh is that I'm using an unstructured mesh. So the purpose is whether the pin can be trained on grid data which uh, are not uh, Position in a structured way. These are the results. This is the comparison of the local strain. This is the, the non excuse me of the non-local strain, the non-local damage against the residuals. Both uh, increments, both load increments at 0.7 and 0 0.5, uh, we do get pretty similar, pretty same uh, results. I think this is the last slide of the of the, um, the results that I would like to show you. Now I just included one more slide, uh, as I said, mainly to you know give you a, an idea of what we're looking on right now and what we believe should come uh, after. So our end goal, as I said at the beginning, is a more universal approximator. And of course, we would like to expand the application of IFEN into more complicated problems where we have additional PDs. But even before we go there and before we increase the complexity of the problems that we're trying to solve, I think there are several things that we need to understand first, even in this 
uh, in this context. For example, uh, the importance of input data scaling. Uh, this is something that uh, I do believe that there is not yet as robust guidance in the literature on scaling techniques that can be general, universal, uh, and can you know uh, decrease, let's say, the efficiency of training network, or at least make it more computationally uh, expensive. For example, the scaling factor of 10 worked. When we tried to multiply it with 100, it didn't work. And everything was just a shot in the dark. The same goes for the hyperparameters. So I showed you the number of layers and neurons, but there was no robust guidance that, you know, you should be using this amount of a net of a layers. This is the width. This should be the depth. So all those things, even for this simple case, now that we are launching a very systematic study, we realize that they are important things that we should be looking at before we make the next step. Because first we need to understand what are the deficiencies of the current state, and then attack those deficiencies uh, by moving on to the next uh, layer. And of course, once this is done, uh, we need to apply this method to you know, different meshes, different geometries, uh, solve more time-dependent problems without having to train again and again, uh, and do all those things. So this is just a summary slide. I'm just uh, I'm not going to, to, to read again. Uh, by that, I would like to conclude my talk. Uh, it's 45 minutes exactly, so I didn't really plan for that <laughs> that well. Uh, again, I would like to thank Professor Kanyavakis. That was an amazing opportunity and a great honor to, to give this speech today. Thank you, everybody, for your attention, and I am looking forward for your uh, feedback and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Panos. Very, very clear. Uh, hi, Panis. Uh, I'm Sundata from Brown. Uh, uh, hi. So I wanted to ask a couple of uh, questions from your presentation. Uh, so uh, could you go back to the slide where you started off with the tensile plate and the tensile plate problem? The single notch? In this case here? Yeah. So I was wondering uh, where you sh uh, where you move from uh, coarse mesh to the fine mesh. When you say that you have used fine mesh and uh, the the results still remain the same, you have the same load displacement uh, curve. So I was wondering, like, how how did you resolve the crack uh, in a very coarse domain? Because you have since you have like uh, very coarse uh, meshes, your gro your gauss points will be much coarser than that you would get in a finer mesh. How did you resolve that? Did you increase the number of gauss points per element? Okay, so very good question. Uh, my answer has two parts. A, this is a function of how widespread damage is, mm -hmm. which is governed by the uh, variable G. G has to be at least uh, twice the element length. Mm -hmm. Actually, yes. I, 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 I think LC, LC, not, not G. LC has to be at least twice the element length uh, mm -hmm. for this method to, to hold. Uh, if you try to do a, a coarser than this, what I'm calling coarse here, probably you will you will end up uh, facing numerical instabilities and you will not be able to uh, get the same results. So mm -hmm. I'm starting my analysis from a fine enough and then I'm just refining and refining again. To make sure that I have, you know, models with different mesh resolution, but at least models that can run uh, with a specific uh, setup. This is one thing, and another thing. Uh, in this context, in this case, I think I'm capping the variable damage d at the uh, value 0 0.99. So this is a common strategy to not end up with a singularity uh, if you completely, you know, have a, a, an inactive. Um, material point. So this is something that's happening a lot in the in the context of CDM. You can use 95, 99, 99, 99, whatever you want. But those two things, the fact that I'm not going to the exact one value of the damage, and the fact that I'm making sure that the LC is twice the element length, ensures that the, my course mess uh, is good enough to, to run in this case. So your course, uh, your course mesh, uh, the element size is L not upon two, and your finer mesh is L not upon four or six. Uh, I have to make those uh, calculations now. Oh, okay, here. okay, okay. No worries. And uh, yeah. yeah, okay, no worries. Maybe I'll do that calculation. Uh, uh, could you go back to the slide where you uh, showed the pin model? Uh, 
Uh, yes, the, the ISEA model. Uh, let me go directly. Uh, you mean here? Uh, not this one. Uh, the previous slide, I think, where, where you actually showed that you have uh, you have used the length scale parameter, uh, the G, which is your length scale parameter, as your input. So, uh, have, like now your output, is that a function of the length scale parameter? Or even if that being constant, you still need to input it. Can I change the length scale parameter to get the output in different length scales? Uh, the question is, just to make sure that I understand correctly, you mean uh, if the setup will work, if you have different Gs? Lens, yes. I don't see why it wouldn't. Because you're making uh, that a function. Because your L, uh, your L, uh, your G is an input. So for different length scale, it should work. So, uh, you, so then I can move independently between coarse and fine, right? Or did you? Um, I mean, the, I the coarse and the fine. So okay. Uh, here's the thing. <clears throat> if if I, if I get correctly, what the what the question is. Um, the setup should work and uh, would work. And actually here, the G doesn't change when I'm using the course and the fine. G stays constant. The only reason I'm, I'm having it here is just to, in the future, have that a little bit more generalizable in the case that G actually may change for the domain that I'm analyzing. So regardless of the mesh, I may have one material here, another material there. So probably I have different material properties and therefore G could be a function of the material domain that I'm analyzing, not the specific mm -hmm. mesh resolution. In any case, I since I'm using a non-local solver, I will I should get the same response uh, for different meshes. For if, if I if I keep uh, the value of G, whatever it is, and I'm messing with the course and I'm messing with the fine, I should get the same response. This is why I am uh, including the reaction force curves just to ensure that you know. Uh, we do get the same capacity, same stiffnesses, uh, those things. I don't know if this answers your question. Yes, it does. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. And uh, hopefully in a good way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And also, like I was wondering, when you said that uh, you're in, you're uh, you're training the model for particular displacement steps, so how did you decide the displacement steps? Since we need to change the displacement step as you move towards propagation. So how did you decide the, for your case, probably it's the load factors that you mentioned? Yes, so, uh, we just had to, I'm sorry, please, please complete and I will answer. So uh, what I was wondering is like, since uh, you are changing the displacement steps, are you keeping them constant or are you changing them as you move towards the crack propagation? Are you moving to finer displacement steps or you are keeping like constant big displacement steps? Uh, so here's the thing. First of all, uh, we selected those three uh, load steps, uh, 0 0.42, 7, and 8, to, uh, just because they represent different uh, parts of the entire curve. Elastic. One sorry. is the el elastic, inelastic ascending, inelastic descending, because we just wanted to see, you know, to explore all the, corner, all, all the corners. Everything is pretty new, so we don't know what exactly we should expect. So this is why we try to uh, select different time increments across the load history. So this is one. Okay. Now, uh, for all the messes, mm -hmm. we analyze them for the specific, for the same time increments. Uh, so when you, were, when you were showing the results, you had a couple of load factors. So yes. you, trained, you trained for all of them, right? Okay, so okay, now, now I get the question. Uh, I'm training for 0 0.5, I'm yeah. testing on 0 0.5. I'm training on 0 0.72, I'm testing on 0.72. Mm -hmm. This is what I said uh, at, at some point in the presentation. We are still limited at training and testing of the same thing because we first make want to make sure this is not uh, it's not a trivial thing because those solutions uh, we know that they can be very uh, unstable numerically. It's yes. not a trivial thing to make sure that the convergence, yeah, yeah. the residuals. So this is where the, the operator come in, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and on top of that, once we have established confidence on this, this is when we try to go to this slide, which is the uh, the next step of what we asked. So here I'm training on different data sets. So I'm putting everything into the network as an input data set. Mm -hmm. And the testing is done on a load factor that I haven't uh, seen yet. 
interpolation. But, yeah. the, the, exactly, the caveat of the, the interpolation, because I'm still in between. I'm not looking yet what's going on uh, on the outside. And you have kept your load factors. The difference in the, the delta U, you have kept that constant. Yes, uh, that was just for uh, just for reasons. There, there was no uh, real reason really? behind that. Okay. Uh, it was just it could be anything. I mean, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you for the questions. I, I I'm really happy you you enjoyed the talk. I mean, you asked all these questions. I, I really like it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Panos, this is Adar from Brown, um, yeah, from Juris Group. Um, I also had one uh, short comment maybe to make. So you showed in all, most of the examples that you have those arrows very close to the zero, zero point, right? Uh, and it seems like not only the location, but like it seems like from the example that you're using um, at this location, the values, right, of the, uh, of the strings are very close to zero themselves. And we had actually a conversation this week with another panel that suggested that um, so the neural networks may have some uh, issues dealing with those very close to zero values because they, they, they need to actually learn those very fine uh, refinements of very small values. Um, did you maybe try like a different example where, or, or, or maybe a larger um, damage that propagates like much more uh, I don't know you don't have values close to zero in that domain okay uh, very good question again my answer will have two parts uh, so once you have a crack propagating you do have regions that uh, they are unloaded because you have a very high stress concentration somewhere and since we're analyzing the entire domain and we want to find the field uh, everywhere we are cursed Let's say we are uh, we will end up uh, having to take a look at what's happening in the regions which are unknown, and in these regions the strains will be on that order. So I can see a direct way of avoiding having to check those regions. But what we can do, and this is what I said, and I started from that at my concluding slide, um, the input, the appropriate input data scaling, aims to target exactly that uh, to avoid having values which are essentially zero, 10 to the minus eight is essentially zero, especially for uh, Adam and LBFGS. Uh, by the way, I don't think that I mentioned that, but first we're doing Adam and then uh, LBFGS. Uh, so we're trying some uh, normalization techniques right now, trying to make sure that everything is also being reflected correctly in the PD, because if you pass in, you know, data that uh, you have somehow sifted, uh, then you also need to make sure that the PD that you're solving for is the correct one. So it's not as straightforward as just uh, changing the input data. But yes, you have a very valid point, and this is uh, the main thing that uh, one of the main things that we're looking at right now. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the question. And Rui, do you have any uh, questions? Uh, no, I don't have any more questions. Okay. Uh, however, I I know that uh, some data has many more questions, uh, Panos. So I talked to her and uh, and we said uh, we would like to invite you to come to, <laughs> to crunch for a three to six months. And of course, I will pay for everything uh, if you have time and if your boss allows you. So then you can uh, answer all these questions and you can generate many more questions with some data in and Rui. So think about it and let me know. That would be amazing. Uh... I don't know what's here right now. Thank you. I just said thank you in Greek. <laughs> uh, we will we will definitely be in touch uh, right you. after actually. Jogren, your turn. Okay. Do we have any more questions for our speaker? Okay, great. Thank you, panels, for your presentation. Uh okay, so this is it for this week's current seminar. Just uh, don't forget we upload our recordings to YouTube channel from in last week. And everyone has a good weekend. See you next week. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye.